of day three, and Daniel is going to tell us about new isolated syntactic singularities with trivial local fundamental group. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, so thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to speak. Um, so this is joint work with uh, Gwyn Bellamy, Cédric Bonafé, Bauer Fu, Paul Levy, and Eric Sommers. Uh, so one of the uh, aims of the talk is to explain how we come up writing a six hours or paper. Uh, and so it's about isolated symplectic singularities. So they already showed up uh, in Tom Brady's talk, for example. So it's a symplectic variety is a normal complex uh, algebraic variety X with a holomorphic two form on its smooth locus, such that for one or any resolution, uh, if you pull back this form uh, to the resolution uh, from the smooth part, uh, it extends to a two, regular two form on the whole of the resolution. So it's not necessarily a symplectic form anymore. It may degenerate. If it doesn't, it's called a symplectic resolution, but that is rather rare. Uh, and so th this notion was introduced by Beauville in 2000. And he remarked that the last condition is automatic uh, in codimension. If the codimension of the singular locus is at least four by a result of planar. Um, and so the singular um, symplectic uh, singularities arise a lot in representation theory. Um, so as examples, so first in dimension two, uh, it's just simple singularities. Uh, quotient of C2 by a finite subgroup of SL2. Uh, and they have this ADE classification. So you have cyclic groups, binary dihedral groups, and binary uh, polyhedral groups. Uh, then a uh, uh, very nice source of examples is nilpotent singularities. Uh, this is where I come from, because uh, uh, since my thesis, uh, I was studying Springer theory. Uh, so if you take a nilpotent orbit, uh, so it's a G orbit in the nilpotent cone of some reductive group G. Um, then, okay, it may, the closure may fail to be normal, but you can always take the normalization. And then this always has symplectic singularities. Uh, so by results of Hinich and Panyushev. Um, Okay, I think that was a private message in the in the chat. Um, then you also have Nakajima quiver varieties um, and Kalogero Moser spaces, which arise from the uh, study of Chevenik algebras. Which so all of those will show up in the talk, uh, but I can mention again hypertoric varieties like in Tom Ridden's talk and the Afanguas Um and so, lo looking at examples, uh, you, it, it's good to look at many examples to see what, what kind of things can arise. So uh, there, there was a problem raised by Boville that, that I will talk about. Um, so in his paper where he introduces a notion, he, he proves the following theorem. So if you have an isolated symplectic singularity, uh, such that the projective tangent cone is smooth, then your singularity is equivalent to the closure of a minimal nilpotent orbit in some simple Lie algebra. Uh, and so then there is a natural question, like can you classify isolated symplectic singularities? So this is all up to smooth equivalence. So it only depends on, on the completion uh, at the po singular point. Um, or you could take a small analytic neighborhood. And so, but a first remark is that if you take any symplectic variety and a finite group of symplectic automorphisms, then the quotient again has symplectic singularities. So already you have a lot of, uh, of uh, possibilities. So then he asked a more precise question is, that is to classify isolated symplectic singularities, but with trivial local fundamental group. So um, usually we look at uh, 
like in Tomstock, uh, conical symplectic varieties with a contracting C star action. And then, of course, they are all contractible. But then you can look at um, the fundamental uh, group of a pointed neighborhood. When you take a fundamental system of neighborhoods, uh, such that one is a de deformation which act of the previous one. So it doesn't depend on the choice uh, of this fundamental system or of K. And, and then that limits uh, the number of possibilities, right? <clears throat> so for example, there was this uh, uh, nil potent, minimal nilpotent orbit closure example. Uh, so you could ask what, what is a lo local fundamental group in that case? Well, it's almost always trivial. So it's an example for the question, except in type CN, including, so for N, at least one. So it includes uh, SL2, which is SP2 of type B2. And so actually, uh, Broville asked if there were any other example uh, other than that. So um, for the next two slides, I'm going to talk about nilpotent singularities. So one thing you can do in nilpotent cones is uh, you have a nice way of taking, taking transverse slices. So if you have a nilpotent orbit O with an element N, uh, uh, an element E, it's a nilpotent cone, then by the jacobson morozov theorem, uh, you can Complete it to a SL2 triple EHF. And then you can construct uh, the, what's called a slow doughy slice. So it's an affine space in the Li algebra, which is centered at E, uh, and it's E plus the centralizer of F in G. And you can see easily that this is indeed transverse to the orbit O. And, and then uh, if you have two orbits, one included in the closure of the other one, you can consider uh, a variety which is all the singularities in between. Uh, that is you take the closure of the larger one and you intersect with a slice to the lower one. Uh, so you only see the orbits so the, it intersects all the orbits in the interval. If you look at the uh, poset uh, with the uh, inclusion of uh, closures. And so it, it might fail to be normal, but you can always take the normalization. In particular, if you take a minimal degeneration so that there is no orbit in between, then you get an isolated symplectic singularity. Uh, so you always have an action of a group on those slices. Uh, so you have the centralizer uh, of the full SL2 uh, subalgebra. Uh, this will stabilize the slice because it will stabilize E and it will stabilize VF as well. Uh, and the structure of the centralizer of F is that you have this centralizer of S, which is a reductive part. It, it may have uh, several components. Um, and, and then there is a unipotent radical. And it's important to note that there is always a contracting C star action on, on those slices uh, using the joint action of H, but uh, uh, as it is, it, uh, it doesn't work directly because it doesn't stabilize E, but you can correct this uh, by uh, using the delay dilation action with weight two to compensate, and then it will stabilize the slide. All right. And then you can try to describe all uh, minimal degenerations uh, in, in your poset of uh, nilpotent orbits. So this was st studied by Kraft and Procesi at the beginning of the 80s, so way before uh, this paper of Boville. Uh, th their initial motivation was uh, 
problem of normality of uh, nilpotent orbit closures. Uh, so for GLN, they are all normal. Uh, but for classical types, they, there is already a new phenomenon is that you can have several branches uh, when you look at, uh, uh, so it can happen in co-dimension two. Uh, so you, you can have two components which are uh, simple singularities of type A. Uh, and, and so to, to simplify the problem, they, they observe that there is a row and column removal row uh, for the possible singularities that occur in classic uh, nilpotent cones of classical type. Uh, so I will explain that. So the first of all is that there is this top singularity. So let me show. Yeah. So yeah, you always have the regular nilpotent orbit on the top, and then if you have a simple Lie algebra, you have a unique subregular orbit. And this, so it's always of co-dimension two. And this singularity is always an ADE singularity. Because um, there was this mystery that so many things are classified by the same diagrams. So here, here is a direct connection. So if you start with an ADE simple Lie algebra, you really get this simple singularity of the same type. And this was conjectured by Grotendik. And uh, using the fuller picture from this theory, you, you can even describe the versal deformation. Um, and so th this theorem was proved by Briscorn in, in 70. Uh, it talked about it at the International Congress of Mathematicians. Uh, and then Slaudery uh, wrote a longer account of this. And he also explained why, uh, so what happens for non simply laced types. So if you have a non simply laced type, you can unfold the Dinkin diagram, which will give you a simply laced type. And it is this singularity that appears. But on top of that, uh, well, you had this action of the reductive centralizer. And actually it is a semi-direct product with a group of components. And so you, you have a, an action so of this finite group, and, and so you can see it as a simple singularity with a, an action of a finite group on top. And so, and for example, in this story of versal deformation, you, you, you only see those who, which respect the symmetry. Uh, so th that was a very nice story. And, and then I, I circle also the minimal nilpotent orbit, which is, so you always have zero. And then for a simple algebra, you always have a unique minimal nilpotent orbit which comes right after zero. So this can be of high co-dimension. So I put in green the co-dimensions of the orbits. Um, and from Kraft and Prochesis results, so um, you, you can describe all minimal degenerations uh, in, in the full process. So you have this Hauser diagram, you can complete all the singularities. And what's remarkable is that you can always reduce in classical types to those two extreme cases. So either simple singularities in co-dimension two or minimal uh, nilpotent orbits. And uh, so I can explain this one on column removal rule. So um, for example, why is it A2 between four one and three two? Uh, well, the first column contains two boxes in, for both partitions. And the, the theorem says that it, it, it's an equivalent singularity to the one which arises in the nilpotent cone of SL3 with those partitions 3 and 2, 1. And that's exactly uh, well, the extreme case of a simple singularity for the subregular case. And so if you would think of the minimal degenerations in the process of partitions, you will see that you are either in this case or the uh, symmetric case with a minimal nilpotent orbit. And so they made the observation that um, uh, the, the simple singularity AK is always exchanged with a minimal singularity AK uh, because of this symmetry in the process, because you can conjugate the partitions. So A1, the intersection of the two families is A1. So for SL2, uh, regular and subregular is the same as zero and minimal. 
all right. So that was at the beginning of the 80s. And so uh, we can explain part of the list of uh, how also how did we get in, interested in this problem. Uh, so with Bawa, Paul, and Eric, we did the, the similar description for Newton codes of exceptional type. Uh, so it was a long work, but uh, so we had several motivations, but um, Bawa Fu was a student of uh, Beauville, so he was really interested in symplectic singularities and uh, he really wanted to see what, what kind of uh, uh, isolated symplectic singularities uh, show up. Like, will we still continue seeing like simple and minimal singularities or maybe we'll see something new? So it's a good way to test conjectures. Um, okay, so we found many simple singularities, many minimally potent orbit singularities. So, so there are more phenomena of branching, like you can have very complicated branching. Uh, it's fun because of branching is completely determined uh, by computations of intersection cohomologic complexes. Uh, so with the lustig shoji algorithm. So for example, in, in the E types is computations of Bainon and Speltations that completely explain the geometry of the branching of the nilpotent orbit closures. So actually you, is by doing those computations, which are completely mechanical, that you you understand more the geometry. Like you, it's very hard to understand the geometry directly, uh, even just the branching. So, so as I said, we saw like many minimal or, or simple singularities. Then there were a few uh, special cases. So some sometimes we found a non-normal singularity. Uh, so, for example, there is one in, which already appears in type G2, the 10 dimensional, um, wait, the 8 dimensional orbit A1 tilde is not uh, normal. Um, but the normalization is a homeomorphism, so it's another kind of uh, non normality. And then in co dimension 2, uh, you have something like a two dimensional cusp, like a pinched plane or something. So the normalization is just C2. And then there are a few others that are non normal. And, and then there are some uh, particular cases in dimension four, but like, for example, we had C4 divided by mu three, uh, which is unique in nipoton cone, but it's like nothing new, it's a uh, quotient singularity. We also had the minimal of type A2 divided by S2. Uh, but then we had this singularity, which was really hard to, to understand between A4, A3, and A4, A2, A1 in type E8, which is a k-dimension four. And finally, one way to understand it was to go down all the way up to A4, because these orbits, um, if you take the reductive centralizer of an element there, um, you will get uh, an SL5 uh, semi-direct uh, S2. But, and, Actually, the full slice here is uh, equivalent to a cover of the, the full nilpotent cone of SL5. So what happens with this cover? So this regular orbit in SL5 has a fundamental group, which is mu5. Then you can take the universal cover and you look at the functions on this cover and you take the spec of that. That's like an affinization of uh, this cover. And then you have like a ramified cover of the whole thing, of the whole input on cone. And like it's five to one on the regular input on orbit. And then already at, at the subregular orbit, so already one to one. And so this A4 singularity, it is uh, just C2 divided by mu5. So you can guess that after taking a five cover, actually this singularity disappears. So now this uh, singular locus in the cover is of co-dimension four. And this is really what describes uh, this part of the nilpotent cone of type E8. 
And so I will tell you more about this singularity. So he, here's why, so you, this, this, this is Balak after notation for nilpotent orbit. So if you see the type of a Levy subgroup with, with nothing more, it's just a regular nilpotent orbit inside this that you have to saturate by the G conjugation action. And, and so I'm saying that the redux centralizer of this has connected component SL5. So there is another SL5. Um, and you can see in, in the extended affine diagram of E8. So you have this affine node here. And so you can take the regular nilpotent orbit in this Levy. And you indeed, you have an SL5 with commute. Uh, well, you have the center of SL5, which is a mu5. Of course, it is in the centralizer. So they intersect in a mu5. Uh, but that explains wh why we have those two SL5. And then, um, so we have this slow slice. So we were very interested um, in the structure of the centralizer, uh, particularly in difficult cases. Uh, in, in easy cases, it's enough to use a reductive centralizer, but in hard cases, you also need the nilpotent part. So we used uh, tables, which were uh, in a book by Lozar and Testerman. Um, so in this case, so you have this E regular in a SL5 levy. Um, and so you take this uh, SL2 triple and then you have the centralizer of F, it has this structure. So you have SL5 and then you have in the nilpotent part. So those are the weights uh, for H, but uh, so if E is a standard representation of uh, SL5, you can see E and S dual and the trivial in this degree. And then in the next degree, you also have lambda two and lambda three. So actually you have all fundamental representations appearing already. And then there are like uh, two more uh, non-trivial uh, uh, degrees where something happens. But you already have all the, ten, all the exterior powers of E. And then you can check that um, if you take an element X, which is E plus a regular nilpotent in SL5 here, plus well-chosen highest weight vectors in, in those representations, then you get an element of A4 plus A3. And then you can use the action of the connected component of the reductive centralizer and take the closure. So you, you get something of dimension 20, which is a dimension of SL5. Uh, in, um, um, I mean, of the nilpotent cone of SL5. So this is included in the slice. And we use many times this argument, which was already in Kraft and Procesi, like, like you have an inclusion and you have the same dimension. And then you have to know how many irreducible components there are, but here there's only one. So uh, we must have equality. So it's a nice homomorphism. So, so this is really, this slice is. Uh, cover of the nilpotent cone of SL5. Um, uh, yeah, because so, so, oh, so first you have equality of, of this with the slice and then why is it the cover? So there is a general description by, by Graham uh, of the, this cover of the nilpotent cone. And basically you have to add to the a joint representation like all minuscule representations. So in type A you have to add all these exterior powers. Um, <clears throat> and so it's by understanding the full uh, large 20 dimensional slice that we understood this uh, minimal degeneration in the end. So what happens in, in so, so this proves all, all those cases at once, but for the intermediate cases, you, you could uh, just use the reductive centralizer part and that, that would be enough. But, but then if you try to add the subregular here, uh, so he, from here to here, you are just using, you just have codimension two. But then if you compare the codimensions uh, for the G orbits, then you have a codimension four instead of two. So 
in this case, you cannot use that argument. Uh, yeah. All right. So, um, and we could also show that it has another description. So you take W5, the dihedral group of order 10. And then when you have a reflection group, you can always form like V plus V star divided by the reflection group. So in this case, it's C4 divided by a dihedral group of order 10. Uh, so we had really explicit equations. And, and then, so first we thought, oh, it could be a new isolated symplectic singularity. And for this case, we had uh, an ad hoc argument that it cannot, using the classifications that it cannot be of the form C4 mod gamma or omin bar mod gamma, but it was really an ugly argument. And besides, we, of course, we wanted to generalize this, uh, replacing five by D. So we find this one for D equals five uh, in nature in the nuproton cone of type E8, but we could try uh, to play the same game. So we have two versions. So you can take a sub sub regular slice in the nuproton cone of SLD and take the D cover, or you can take this uh, symplectic quotient C4 modulo the dihedral group of order 2D and do this certain, this particular blow up. Uh, and see what happens. Um, but then we were not very active for a while about this problem. And meanwhile, uh, Cédric Bonafé, my, one of my former supervisors was studying Calogero Moser spaces. Uh, for example, they have this whole program with Raphael Rouquet, um, like how to extend cash uh, theory to complex reflection groups, uh, like families and cells and so on. Uh, and they use the geometry of Calogero Moser spaces. And then if, if this coincides with cache diagnostic uh, data for Vi groups, then it's a sensible definition for complex reflection groups. Um, and Cedric studied in particular very explicitly uh, the hydral groups. So as soon as you have um, a complex reflection group, so with a reflection representation V uh, and a parameter C. So I call wave W the, the set of reflections. Uh, so it just means, so we are in the complex case. They don't have to be of order two. It just means that the fixed points are called dimension one. Uh, and then this parameter is, is a complex function, which is constant on, on the reflection, which is invariant by conjugation. And then there is also this T parameter. Then we, with that, those data, you, you can define the rational Cheminic algebra. Uh, so it's a particular case of uh, symplectic reflection algebras, which were uh, introduced by Tinghoff and Ginsburg. And, and then the, you, you have two cases which are uh, very different. It's, T equals zero or not equal to zero. And if it's not equal zero, you can suppose it's one. Uh, when, when T is one, the center is very small. It's just a complex number. But when T is zero, the center is so big that the, the full algebra is of finite type over its center. So then the center is very interesting. And the Calogero Moser space is the spec of the center of AJ H zero C. Um, and so it's a deformation of the Z zero W, which is this symplectic quotient singularity. And this deformation is affine, irreducible, normal, and it has symplectic singularities by results of think of Ginsburg and Gordon. Uh, so, so this provides also nice examples of symplectic singularities. And uh, there is a very nice package in Magma by Ulrich Thiel called CHAMP for Cherenic Algebras. And uh, he collaborated with Cédric Bonafé to, to, to implement the things that uh, allow you to find explicit equations for the C of W and so on. Uh, so 
Cédric did first uh, comp complete computations for B2 completely by hand. Um, and then when it matched uh, what could be obtained with CHAMP, it, it, it was uh, reassuring both for the program and for the hand calculations. <clears throat> so for dihedral groups, we just write ZC of D for ZC of the dihedral group. Uh, so your so first of all, um, because it, it's a real reflection group, you have V isomorphic to V star, and this implies that there will be a SL2 action on this uh, ZC of D. And besides, uh, I, yeah, so here it's a case of uh, equal parameters. So um, in the, in the case where D is odd, there is only one conjugacy class of reflections anyway. But when D is even, you could also consider an equal parameter case. Uh, well, if you take this equal parameter case, you have a unique singular point at zero. And so uh, Cedric wanted to show. So we, we, we were discussing regularly uh, about this potential new isolated symplectic singularities. And actually, he also had a family of potential new isolated Symplectic singularities. But to, to be interesting, one had to show that the local fundamental group was trivial and that there are really new examples and that I uh, already know. Um, and, and then when we, the more we talked, the more we were convinced that it was actually the same family of singularities, uh, in particular with discussions of, with uh, Gwyn Bellamy. Um, as we will see later, because yeah, there were many clues. Um, so yeah, a little remark is that, of course you have a sister action since you have a central action, but it is not a contracting action to, to the singular point. And then during the first lockdown in France, uh, Cédric had a lot of time and he had uh, like powerful programs. And so he, he computed the explicit equations up to ZC of eight. And he saw a pattern and he proved it. So he, he told me that he never did anything uh, uh, as brutal in his whole mathematical life. Um, and he also had time to stare at the equations. And he saw some quantity which was uh, appearing a lot of times. So then he, he thought about doing a holomorphic change of variables, which is SL2 equivalent. And then he found like uh, modified equations which were much simpler. And in this case, there is a contracting sister action. So th this confirms in the, this case, a conjecture of Kalidin that uh, you can always find an equivalent symplectic singularity where you have a system, contracting sister action. Um, and, and since you have this contracting action, the lo local fundamental group uh, you can compute it just as a fundamental group of the complement of the singular point. So it's uh, conceptually easier already. Okay, so let's, so he, he was able to prove this to reality. So let's see how he did. So first, this variety, you can embed it in SL2 plus uh, uh, the D plus one dimensional representation of SL2. And then you, you can project to SL2, and then uh, you can take the determinant. So you have this map going to C, and then you can look at what, happen, what happens over C star. Uh, so the, the inverse image, uh, it's an open subvariety U. And it turns out that on, on this part, it's a vibration with fibers uh, SL2 divided by mu d. So you, you, you can uh, describe the fundamental group of U. And because this is a, so the complement here is of real co-dimension uh, two. So you, you know that the, you will have a surjection of fundamental groups. And then because of the vibration, you have a long exact sequence in homotopy. And so you have the pi one of this SL2 of the fiber, which will be mu d. And then you have the pi one of C star, which is Z. 
So he had two generators, alpha and beta, very explicit. Uh, and then you, you can see, look at their images here. And, and then you have to show that they are trivial. And you notice that they are included in some uh, uh, surface, which is simply connected. And, and so that's how he proved it. Uh, so that was fantastic news. Um, and to see why they are new, so they are new at least as symplectic uh, singularities, uh, because so for, from the Poisson structure, you can see that there is a Lie algebra structure on the cotangent uh, uh, space at the singular point. And Cedric also computed that. And then there is a special case for D equals four, then you, you have SL3. But starting from D at least five, it's uh, this semi-direct product with SL2 and this D plus one dimensional representation. So you see, um, yeah. Actually, if you restrict SL3 to the principal SL2, which you can see also as SO3, uh, you also get that in, in the case D equals four. But then you, you see a difference like, so the singularity in the case D equals four is not new, it's a minimal singularity of type A2. But after that, so for the minimally potent orbit of some simple type different from type C, uh, this Lie algebra is just a Lie algebra you started with. So in particular, if you have not a simple algebra, it's not a minimally potent orbit singularity. Mm. <clears throat> All right. And finally, we using that the uh, fundamental group uh, is trivial in this case, um, it was possible to see that all the, all the singularities that we consider were equivalent actually. And, the, and that's why in the end we, we are all together. So Gwyn uh, was able to, to make the connection using Nakajimia quiver varieties. So let's see. So first we have this symplectic quotient singularity. And so Cedric was telling this Kalojo mother space and he found these simplified equations and using those, this description, you could show that the local fundamental group was trivial. And actually uh, looking at those equations, we recognize this uh, blow ups. Uh, it was as in the description that we had for E8. So, his simplification was actually a blow up. Uh, so there are some general theorems which uh, tell you that you have, you, you can do two things to a singularity. You can deform it or, or you can take uh, blow ups uh, or partial resolutions. So if you want to stay in, in the world of symplectic singularities, you cannot just do any blow up. Usually the blow up of a symplectic singularity will not be symplectic anymore. Unless, unless we take like quaint blow up, um, but when when you have you, when you do those two things, uh, there there should be diffeomorphisms among them, and so actually uh, Cedric proved it concretely in this case. That's what happened. So um, and then yeah, so an uh, early observation of Green was that okay you. You can compare the dihedral group with the complex reflection group GD12. Uh, so you have an inclusion of a subgroup of index D inside this. And, and actually, you can look at the Kalogero or Moser spaces for both groups. And the relation is that you have a quotient by mu D. Uh, and Nakajima. So it can be described by a Nakajima quiver variety. And this can also be used to describe nilpotent singularity. So you, you, you have this uh, sub server glass slice in SLD, which is described by the same Nakajima variety. And so for a long time, what we could say is that, okay, um, we have two families of singularities. We still didn't know that the one of them has this property of trivial local fundamental group. But we had like two uh, ramified D covers of the same thing, basically. But then once you know that this one has a trivial local fundamental group, 
So it means like on the smooth slope is uh, here, all, all the fundamental groups are mu d. And if you have a d cover, so here the, also the, the uh, fundamental group of the open part has to be uh, trivial as well. And then you can, so, so, so if you take universal covers, it's not just like intermediate covers uh, of the greedy, which could be anything. No, it's the universal cover. So on the smooth part, it's really the same thing. And then um, you can argue like this, like uh, you have a, a result of Andreotti and Stoll um, that says that you, you, you can extend holomorphic maps uh, because here the complement is of complex one dimension that is two. Uh, so finally, all those description uh, gives the same singularity, like analytically. Um, okay. And now I would like to say a few last remarks. So we, we so first of all, you, you can give like easy descriptions of the singularity. So first of all, symplectic question singularity uh, you can see at the uh, SL2 times C star clo uh, orbit closure. I forgot to write orbit. Uh, so SL2 is of dimension three. If you had C star, you have dimension four, so it's plausible. Uh, and, and here the C star acts by with weights two and D. Okay, and, and actually in the blow up, now the, you have different weights. Now you have two and d minus two, but you can still de describe this new singularity with a SL2 times C star closure. And so now we are thinking about what happens um, with unequal parameters. So for, for now we are looking at the blow up side. Uh, so in the case of uh, even d, then the singular locus is not irreducible. So Actually, the singular locus, what is it? Is when you have non trivial stabilizers uh, uh, in this uh, V plus V star. And you can see, by, so you, you look at maximal parallelic subgroups up to conjugacy. And in, in W2D, there are two conjugacy classes. So, so that's why you have two components. And then uh, you can do some blow ups. And then uh, it seems that what you obtain is uh, uh, this Z. So, so if you do that for 2D, you obtain this one, but di divided by uh, S2. And it seems plausible that that's what you would obtain you, for Kalogero Mozart spaces uh, with unequal parameters. Uh, and so I think there is a. Um, the, like these Kalogero Moser spaces are, give you a wonderful family of examples. In particular, there's this infinite family of complex reflection groups. So you can go beyond the uh, rank two, and uh, I think it will be very interesting. And in particular, uh, so th th there is this notion of symplectic duality. And I think there should be some kind of uh, level one duality which explains it. Um, but I don't know much about that. And also, um, so after we publish our paper about nilpotent singularities in exceptional types, at some point uh, we noticed that um, we were quoted regularly by a group of physicists, uh, the group of Ami, Hai, and Annie in, uh, in, at Imperial College. So the, they look at moduli spaces of, of uh, physics series, basically. And they do exactly the same thing as, as we do uh, in the sense that you see Hassel diagrams of symplectic leaves and they want to know what the singularities are. Um, and yeah, it's very interesting, but the, the point, the thing is that I couldn't understand the first line in the papers. So since January, I've been <laughs> talking uh, uh, with Antoine Bourget in particular. Um, and so I, I'm slowly learning about brains, uh, as reality, 
and magnetic quivers. So yeah, so they, they have a very good habit uh, that as soon as they talk about some uh, singularity here and regularity, they, they will compute the Hilbert series. This is not something that we did systematically. Because, yeah, um, uh, the, 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 another source of uh, example is the affine Grassmannian. And I said, and Malkin, Osric, and Vibornov had classified minimal degenerations. So it's mostly simple and minimal singularities, but then there are some exceptions. So I was very interested in those exceptions. And with geometric SATAKE, you can have further information. So what, what invariants uh, could you use to, to see, for example, if something, if two singularities are likely to be equivalent or if you can discard the fact that they're equivalent? Um, so of course you have intersection cohomology, but usually people look at intersection cohomology with Q coefficients. Um, but actually it's useful to, to look at torsion as well in, in intersection cohomology. And if you look at the affine Grassmannian, uh, you can use geometric satake. So it encodes representation theory of the long lens serial group. So if you know what happens uh, in the modular case, modulo P, uh, for those representations, if you have some non-trivial decomposition numbers, uh, it gives you some indication of uh, what primes appear in the torsion in the intersection community. Um, and now, if you look at this uh, sub sub regular singularity in uh, the nil proton cone of SLD, so you, it only involves two part partitions. So you have d, d minus 1, 1, and d minus 2, 2. And those singularities, they are all in the affine Grassmannian of type A1. And so they, it encodes the representation theory of SL2 uh, for highest weight d. Uh, and then you have the highest weight and then the next weight is the d minus two and then the next one is d minus four. And so here's a first intersection form. It's just one one uh, anyway, but uh, is d. So for primes dividing d, you have a non-trivial decomposition number there. Um, but the next intersection form is a binomial coefficient uh, d choose two. So say if p does not divide d and say p is odd, nothing will happen at the first step, but in the second step, since d choose two is d times d minus one over two, you, you will see things happening for primes dividing d minus one. Um, so it's, when you take the d cover, uh, like d, d minus one is prime to d, so this phenomenon should survive in this cover. So like I was trying to see what, what could be plausible and I thought, oh, so now we have an infinite family of isolated symplectic singularities. And among the exceptions that there was uh, in the affine Grassmannian, there, there was some called AC2 and AG2. So they have the same intersection column G of, of a Q as a small A2, so the minimal A2. But the torsion is respectively for the primes three, five, and seven. So it seemed like the beginning of a series. Um, and so I said, oh, the, so that might be it. But then talking uh, with Antoine Bourget, uh, so what, which is in, in the group of Hamiha and Annie, he asked me, okay, what, what is your, the Hilbert series? And so we could see, you know, okay, it was not true. But at the same time, they were also working on singularities in, in the affine Grassmannian. So now the, their paper is on archive. Um, and so uh, I gave her, them uh, the Hilbert's series of our singularity. And in 48 hours, they, they could come up with a magnetic quiver, which describes it. Um, so yeah, I, I really hope uh, to learn more about this and to uh, understand uh, symplectic singularities this way. I, I, I'm not an expert at all in symplectic uh, geometry, but I find it uh, really intriguing. So uh, I guess I will continue. So um, yeah, I guess I've finished. So thanks very much. And thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for the very interesting talk. Perfect time. Does anybody have any questions for Daniel? Uh, Daniel, can I ask you, are there any examples of known uh, uh, symplectic uh, uh, singularities uh, which then do not arise from uh, something smooth together with doing something with, uh, with a reductive uh, group? Uh, 
so what do you say? So arising from something smooth? Well, I mean, you, you, you all your constructions, some they are, I mean, mm. some are by simplistic reduction. Sometimes it's a bit different. I mean, you have orbits, etc. But you always have somewhere uh, a, a reductive group uh, uh, acting on something. Uh, and then maybe you take orb you take uh, orb you take uh, orbits or you take quotients and you do things and that's how I understand as far as I understand they all arise starting from something smooth. Okay. Uh, so my question is whether there is any examples that I mean as far as I have seen in your talk, no. But uh, I mean, is there an exp is there an expectation like that? Huh? Yeah, I, I don't know examples of what you're saying, but um, yeah, in any case, it's worth looking at all the sources we can think of. And I mean, another question is whether there are, are there, if you, if you start with a simplistic singularity and characteristic P, so I'm not sure uh, exactly what, I mean, how one uh, defines that, uh, if there are, one has to be particularly careful or not. I mean, are there, do they always lift to characteristic zero? And, and, and then the next question would be trying with, uh, if you try with, start with a simple Lie algebra and characteristic P. Mm -hmm. That does not come from characteristic zero. I mean, can you cook up some uh, simplistic singularities there? Uh, well, that would be very nice. So, did you say that you can always lift? No, I'm asking. Uh, I don't know, and that's my question: whether you, whether they can be lifted, simplistic singularities to simplistic singularities. I don't know, but one could try indeed. Are there any other questions for Daniel? Can I actually ask, um, so you mentioned that there's this uh, connection between uh, the singularities and calculating the green polynomials for, in, for finite reductive groups. Does your, I mean, I think this algorithm also extends to the complex reflection group case or can be extended. And I wondered if there was a connection between the singularity you're finding and whether you can also make a connection between these singularities and this more general algorithm. Well, uh, first question is, would you have uh, an analog of the nilpotent cone for complex reflective, uh, for complex reflection groups? So yeah, I, I know you can try to, and some people did uh, like generalizations of Springer correspondence um, but it's not, as far as I know, it's not connected to a, a geometric object. Um, uh, wait. Well, actually, yeah, this work of uh, Shoji, Sona, and so on, uh, where you can look at higher level uh, actions. So you, yeah, okay. Mm. So uh, wh wh what I mentioned, it was only to understand the branching behavior of the orbit closures at lower orbits. Um, yeah. I don't know. We can talk about it later. If you want. OK, thanks. Any vague? connections at all between this stuff that you're doing and and other fun things that you can do with complex reflection groups that you know about like quantum geometry and talk iterative unity <laughs> um i don't know but specifically like is there was there some connection between these singularities you saw in the affine grassmannian and these singularities you constructed from the for, for a1 tilde and the singularities you constructed for dihedral groups? Well, the, in type A, you, you find the same singularities in nilpotent cones, uh, in the affine Grassmannian, and in quiver varieties. Uh, but the thing is that in the affine Grassmannian of SLN, you see all nilpotent singularities of all nilpotent cones um, for partitions uh, in at most n parts. So when you look at sub-sub-regular, it's only two parts, so it, we are 
you see all those singularities in, in the Arpengos manion of A, A1. Which doesn't include the stuff you're doing. Well, the, uh, then you would have to take the cover of that. Like in the Arpengos manion, okay, if, if you take two successive weights uh, in one component, Mm, right, right, right. Yeah, totally yes. But usually, it's called dimension two, and you will have a simple singularity. Oh no, no that, that's sorry. That thing that you were these two partitions that you're comparing are two row partitions, right? Mm. So they do appear in the affine best model, Is what you're saying? You just have to take a copy. Yeah, you, yeah. Um, so, so in you would take three successive orbits in the affine best uh, take a cover of that, and then. The singularity in the middle disappears, and, and you have an isolated singularity of four dimension four. I have a question. This uh, observation of Gwyn's relating this Z zero to a quiver variety. Can you say kind of how he noticed this, or and is it? Can, does this quiver variety relate to the uh, slot of slice to this null potent orbit or? Um, yeah, so. Um, uh, we're using previous work, like se several previous works uh, connecting. So it was known that Nakajima quiver varieties uh, can be used to describe uh, the photon singularities. Um, and also Kaledro Moser spaces. So I, I, I can tell you the references later. Um, this is, they can be used to describe these singularities in general, not just in type A, but in other types too, right? Um, well, in particular, in, in type A, you have uh, uh, like more things. More things are available. Yeah, I couldn't tell you exactly what 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 you can do in other types. Uh, but th this describes so this uh, other with products GD one two, uh, and I guess for GD one n, you have such descriptions. Are there any more questions for Daniel? Okay, if you think of something, please uh, go to the link I reposted from uh, before to the in, in the gather. We can continue informal discussion, and otherwise, our third talk will be at five. Right? <laughs> okay. Thank you again, Daniel.